Hello. Today we're going to be talking about this book. That's right, I actually have a physical copy this time. Uh, in case you can't read that, uh, the book is Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877. And unlike a lot of my previous videos, um, instead of reading the whole book and then giving some like reflections on it at the end, this is a really like serious history book that I've struggled to get through in the past. And so I'm actually gonna make a video for each chapter. Um, and this video is going to just introduce the concept of the book and also talk about the preface and the introduction. Um, okay, so Reconstruction. In case you didn't know, Reconstruction is the period of American history immediately following the Civil War in which um, people fought the legal and political battles to define what exactly the results of the American Civil War were going to be. Um, it's a very interesting period in theory, but in practice, um, in practice, it can often be quite dry and boring, which is a strange contradiction in terms because everybody loves the Civil War. Everybody loves talking and thinking about the Civil War, at least. And Reconstruction is sort of like the, you know, post-game debate to determine what the Civil War had even been about. What was it even for? Um, and what would its results actually be? So it seems like everybody should be really interested in Reconstruction, too. But the problem is that they're not. Um, and so that the boringness of this era, I think, rather than just being something that is like an objective fact of the history, I think is more an emergent fact of the historiography. Historiography is a pretentious word for the way that history gets written. Um, and... Foner, Eric Foner actually goes over that a little bit in, in the preface. Um, there's Reconstruction is in kind of an interesting place right now um, because the early attempts to define Reconstruction were dominated by something called the Dunning School, um, which is a, a historical movement of writers who sought to explain Reconstruction as being essentially an overstep, as being kind of a mistake. Like the Civil War was fought over slavery and then the um, lamentable result of Reconstruction was an attempt to uh, you know, enfranchise black people too quickly and basically put them in government uh, against the will of the, the South. And it was a big mistake and it led to all sorts of bad stuff. And as you can probably tell by my um, summary there, the Dunning School is just foundationally racist. It's based on a racist idea of American history um, and a, just a concept of um, who black people are and what they're like that is fundamentally racist. It, it's basically founded on the idea that black people are incapable of self-rule, self-governance, and that giving them the vote, giving them political power was a mistake. Um, so fortunately, the Dunning School was overturned in like the 30s, uh, in, in the, the 40s and 50s, I think it was. Um, it was overturned a while ago, uh, smashed to bits, even though you'll still see people referencing ideas from the Dunning School, like racist ideas tend to have an afterlife. After they've been killed in academia, they tend to keep floating around for decades and sometimes even hundreds of years. Um, and um, and uh, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting distracted, but I, I, I just want to go back and actually say that uh, racist ideas don't actually get destroyed by academia. Um, it's actually kind of, uh, I don't know, a frustrating problem for academics is that they can prove over and over and over again, like definitively, that some racist idea is wrong, and yet people will sort of go on believing it. And I, I do think a little similar dynamic holds in Reconstruction in that people have stopped, like academics have completely destroyed the idea that Reconstruction was somehow some sort of like political misstep in giving black people rights too, too soon or something. Um, but people still say that. Um, and it seems like no amount of like academics correcting them on that is going to uh, fix a belief that isn't rooted in any sort of like allegiance with truth in the first place. Um, anyway, so if you've seen the movie Birth of a Nation, or if you've heard of the movie Birth of a Nation, Birth of a Nation is basically a film that is rooted in this Dunning School ideology. It's a film that's rooted in the concept that the concepts, the idea of reconstruction as an arc of history 
that is pioneered by the Dunning School. And the Dunning School was destroyed uh, in the academy, but it was destroyed at the same time that these suspicions were growing in the academy of what's called grand narratives. And a grand narrative is a narrative that seeks to explain everything. Like all data in the world can be uh, put under a grand narrative. So an example would be communism, which explains the arc of the entire arc of history. Or even, um, I don't know, capitalism or libertarianism, which also seek to explain the entire arc of history. Um, progressivism, whatever. There's a lot of isms that, that fall under this critique of grand narratives. And so the idea was, uh, in, in history, one of the effects that the suspicion of grand narratives had was um, that people tried to sort of destroy the previous narratives, the previous narrative arcs that had been given to periods of history. And new historians who sought to create new ideas and concepts, few of them aimed to create these grand arcs that explain an entire period of history. Rather, people would just go into very minute and often like extremely interesting details, like day, daily life for, I don't know, women living in Maine during the Reconstruction era. That's just an example. I don't know of a study that's exactly like that. But these very interesting and important things. But no one was interested in taking all that stuff together and creating a narrative that explains the whole arc of that period. Um, so I think that this story of the story of Reconstruction goes a long way to explaining why it is that this period is so confusing for people. Um, first of all, I think without a strong narrative arc, these sorts of legal technicalities and like battles in court and in, in, um, uh, in Congress are just not going to be interesting. You need, like, they don't have an inherent narrative weight to them that, say, people fighting a war does, you know? Even if you don't know anything about the Civil War, even if you, like, are watching a movie about the Civil War and you, like, don't even speak English, just seeing all those guys, like, line up and be like, Phew! it's, like, it's, it's interesting, you know? Um, but having someone, you know, argue a case in front of the Supreme Court does not have an inherent, like, interest the way that people killing each other does. Um, so first of all, I do think that wars, uh, such as the Civil War, are just inherently going to be more interesting than, um, you know, periods of political and legal um, turmoil. But if we actually care about the underlying, like, meaning of the Civil War, like, not just the pew-pew people dying type stuff, but, like, what did it mean and what did it do? Well, we're not going to find those answers in studying the Civil War itself. We're only going to find those answers in studying Reconstruction. And the reason I think that that's something worth doing is that in many ways, Reconstruction is the time period, the, the period in which America was set down the path that we're on now. And then it's sort of, we're reaching an impasse. You know, we started on the trajectory towards the iceberg in Reconstruction, and, and now we're there, baby. We're hitting the iceberg. Um, I'm not alone in this concept of Reconstruction. Ever since the period Reconstruction itself, historians have sought to explain their modern condition in terms of Reconstruction. I mean, I guess that's really common across all types of history. But I would say, for example, that a history of the Roman Empire, uh, at least now, can potentially, you know, you can write a history of the Roman Empire that isn't seeking to explain uh, 2024 America. Um, whereas a history of Reconstruction, the histories of Reconstruction that have been written, has sort of always been trying to explain the current moment in American history. And my interest comes from the exact same place. Um, I basically think that Reconstruction is a very contradictory period where we argued, you know, the Civil War on its own didn't inherently mean anything. We had to decide afterwards what it had meant all along. Um, and Reconstruction was the era in which we really sort of hammered out those details and created the battle lines of, of meaning that still exist to this day. By the way, brief aside, let me just tell you what the Civil War was about. Okay, so there's a big disagreement, right, between um, people who think that the Civil War was about states' rights, whatever that means, and people who think that the Civil War was about slavery. Um, I'm going to explain not only what the Civil War was about, uh, but also why uh, those battle lines of meaning came to be uh, in, in that particular way. Um, okay, so 
at the outset of the Civil War uh, for the South. So the, the first thing to understand is that there's an asymmetry here. The Civil War was about two different things for the two different people that the two different groups that were fighting it. So you have the Confederacy and you have the Union. And they at the outset of the war, they do not agree what the Civil War was about. At the outset of the war, the uh, Confederacy, which really started the Civil War, um, was very clear, this is about slavery. The institution of slavery is on track to be destroyed. Um, slowly but surely, our rights as slaveholders are being chipped away, and we need to fight a war to secure our right to own slaves. Um, they were very clear about that. It's written into uh, some of the constitutions of the uh, seceded um, Confederate states. Uh, the Union on the other hand, uh, could not, didn't really care about slavery. Um, the Union, it's in the name, cared about uh, unity. They didn't want the Civil War, they, they didn't want the Confederacy to secede. Um, so you end up with a situation where they have misaligned goals. Like the Union doesn't really care that much about this slavery thing. They're not fighting a war to free the slaves. Uh, the Confederacy is fighting a war to keep the slaves. They're, despite the fact that their motivations are misaligned, it leads to the situation where the only thing that's left to do is fight. You know, the Confederacy says, we're leaving because you're trying to destroy slavery. And the North says, uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? Like, that, you can keep your slaves, but you can't secede. And it's too late. The South has already seceded, so now we have to fight a war. Okay, so there's that asymmetry. The South and the North do not agree on what the war is actually about. Um, but then there's a second asymmetry. The North doesn't agree with itself, and the South doesn't agree with itself. As the war drags on, and then after it ends, the meaning of the war that we fought changes. So at the beginning of the Civil War, you have here's the meaning of the war that we're about to fight, and then once the war gets started, that slowly changes, and then once it ends, that changes some more. And then you end up with a situation where what, we, what the North was saying the war was about at the beginning is not the same thing as what the North is saying the war was about at the end. Um, and ditto with the South. So the dynamic here that changed uh, the meaning of the war was basically lots of people dying. Um, nobody expected the war to be as savage and, and deadly and horrible as it actually was. And so as more and more people died, and the temptation to just be like, fuck it, who even cares about this shit, uh, increased. Um, politicians and soldiers and generals and kind of everyone was were reaching out for a more meaningful purpose for the war, right? And so for the North, that transformed from this is a war to keep the Confederate states in the Union. It transformed to this is a war about liberty, defending freedom and, you know, emancipation and all that good stuff by freeing the slaves. You know, if you're, if you're you know, Johnny Goodboy marching off to war on day one of the war, maybe being like, oh, it's a war to keep together the Union, you know, whatever. Uh, we'll be home in like three weeks. That's great. But, you know, if you've been fighting the war for like three years, you've seen people die, that's not going to cut it anymore. So by, by that point, the meaning of the war for the North has changed. Um, it changes again after the war uh, as well. And for the South, similarly, since a lot of the, um, since a lot of the Confederate soldiers did not own slaves, um, the idea that they were... Um, the idea that they were fighting for other people to keep their slaves, like, sure, I guess that works at the beginning of the war. Like, oh, I, I live in Alabama and we're doing this independence thing. Uh, okay, whatever. I, I guess I'm in a, an army now. Um, that's fine. But uh, once you've been fighting for a while, you need something more important to grab onto. So that's where this narrative started changing, and it slowly and surely became about states' rights, which is basically a convoluted way of saying. Freedom, but a concept of freedom that includes our ability to keep slaves. So, in a very, like, distinctly American way, um, at the beginning of the war, uh, what are we fighting over? Who knows? Uh, doesn't doesn't matter. It's it's this, like, economic, like, like esoteric stuff. None of the soldiers are actually thinking about this bullshit. Um, and then by the middle of the war, uh, the reasoning has evolved um, to be like, what, are, what is, uh, you know, Johnny Greycoat over here fighting over? Uh, freedom. What is uh, Johnny uh, Bluecoat over here fighting over? Also freedom. So you have these uh, you know, two groups of Americans fighting over two different concepts of freedom. Um, uh, anyway, I'm sorry for that tangent. That's a little bit uh, overly simplistic, 
but there, I've done it. I've explained not just what the war was actually fought over, but why these disagreements uh, change as the course of the war happens. Um, and honestly, you know, until I saw that narrative from my boy Foner here, I was also very, very confused. Like, what is this war fought over? It seems like some, it seems like the politically correct answer is slavery, but the more like nuanced answer is some sort of states' rights-ish union keeping together thing that no one ever really goes into a lot of detail on. And the reason that this is so confusing is because the two sides that fought the war disagree, and with each other and with themselves. So there's all of these different narratives that um, explain why the war happened and what it was about. And, um, you know, it's weird because when you think about this stuff, it becomes apparent that there's no, like, there's no, like, true truth that you can, like, reach into that it, into history and, like, pull out that is fully narratively satisfying. Because the most, like, technically correct uh, answer to why the war was fought was because, like, the Confederacy started shooting at people and you can't be a country if you don't respond to that by shooting back. Um, which is not narratively satisfying. So if you want a narratively satisfying answer to why the war happened, you sort of have to go out on a limb and start talking about like this narrative stuff that feels a little bit less feels a little bit squishy compared to just just the facts, ma'am. Um, anyway, so reconstruction as an era is when the meaning of all that stuff gets hammered out. And some people have even argued. I've, I've seen this argued. I haven't actually read the book, but I've seen the title of the book, which is like how the South won this, how the South won the Civil War, basically, uh, something like that. And I've seen this argument put out there that the South lost the war but won the peace. They lost the bat, they lost the war but won the war. If that makes sense, like yes, their soldiers were defeated, but they ultimately ended up finding a way to get everything that they wanted. Um, I haven't actually engaged with that argument in, by like reading reading the books or something. Maybe I will read one of those books as I'm working my way through this this tome of of uh, ancient knowledge. Um, uh, but the point is that Reconstruction is a time period where you know the war can be betrayed. The meaning, the freedom that was fought for during the war, can be sort of quietly, silently undone. Uh, now that the bullets have stopped flying. Um, I find that narrative a little bit simplistic. Um, I think there's a little bit of some truth to it. Um, and the thing that's so tantalizing for me about Reconstruction, other than it being this sort of coda of American history that sort of explains the trajectory that we're on now, is also um, that despite it being this coda of American history. It's also a massive blank space in our historical imagination. Um, one sort of passing interest I've had for a while now is on Reconstruction era films. And there aren't really that many of them. Um, there's like Gone with the Wind, Song of the South, um, a couple of others. Um, there's a billion films about the Civil War. Um, but there's like five, you know, you could fit them into one afternoon if you really had to, um, on Reconstruction. Uh, and it's just odd that a period that has so much historical significance, that explains so much about American history, is also just a blank space in our memory. It's like, you know, if you think of America as a body politic, it's like our, the American mind, the... American historical memory has some sort of horrible disease that prevents it from understanding the most important episode from its past. It's it's like Reconstruction is some sort of trauma that uh, that the American you know uh, mind has created these defense mechanisms to avoid facing. And you know, in keeping with that point, I think it's quite interesting that a lot of the um, novels and books that I have seen that tackle Reconstruction or that are set in Reconstruction have some sort of supernatural element to them. So the most obvious one is, is uh, Beloved, which is a ghost story set during Reconstruction. Um, and the concept, the idea of a ghost story in Reconstruction is such a good one because um, 
you know, it's a period where people do, in this very real sense, feel that they're haunted by the past of the American Civil War. Um, but I also feel that there's an, a, a sort of second haunting that comes from the future. I mean, I guess the people living at the time might not have really felt this. But reading back, it's certainly something that feels alive, feels real, is this the weight of possibility in that moment. And you know what? I Actually, I'll go out on a limb and say that this was something that was, was felt at the time. Like, I think the people who, you know, the Black people who were the first people to enter the American legislative process, I feel like they definitely knew that they were, you know, opening a new chapter in American history. There's this, the weight of this massive potential weighing down on them that um, isn't realized. It isn't completed in that era. Um, in many ways, this, this era is, is a tragedy. Um, the other supernatural story uh, that's very, that's pulpy, uh, that I found out about just today actually is called, uh, the, the wild, wild west. Um, it's a movie. I, I haven't actually seen the movie, but I do know it's a, uh, it's one of the only Westerns I could find that was set during reconstruction. Um, by the way, if I happen to be wrong about this, if you can think of a movie off the top of your head that's set during reconstruction or a show or, or something. Um, that's set during Reconstruction that I haven't named, please uh, sound off about it in the comments. Um, be as rude as you like. Uh, actually, don't really hurt my feelings when people are rude in the comments. But please let me know if um, there's a movie or something that I missed, because I'm really hoping to do sort of a, like almost a film study of this era, um, since there are so few films. Um, but anyway, so Wild Wild West. It has Will Smith in it. It has a giant robot tarantula. I don't know what it's actually about, but... It seems to partake in this, um, I've, I've heard that it, it's actually like shocking because it's one of the few reconstruction, uh, set in reconstruction era films that presents reconstruction in a realistic minus the giant robot tarantula way. And that it's like a political revolution and inclusion of African Americans in the political process that was betrayed by white supremacy. And it shows that in a very, you know, simple and straightforward way rather than either just being straightforwardly racist the way that some older films are, or being obscurantist in the way that I guess would be maybe a temptation for some people. Um, and anyway, I just find it so fascinating that in order to, it, it, it is really almost like a primeval American trauma in, in that like, it disappears from our nation's co like conscious memory, but it sort of reappears in our unconscious. And, and, and it can be almost dreamed about as long as these fantastical elements are injected. Um, so yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting period. Um, I'm hoping to go chapter by chapter. There are uh, 14 chapters, including the introduction and the epilogue. Um, I guess I'll be doing them maybe like once a week, we'll see. Um, I've tried to read this book before and, and failed. Um, so this time I'm going to be successful or at least I will um, fail you know, publicly on this YouTube channel. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a fantastic book. Um, I'm, I'm excited to get into it. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about the era in general. That's it. I'll see you soon.